I'm Dr. Robert Jackson with the Institute for Classical Education, and I'm here today with Professor Frederick Turner. Thank you so much, Fred, for joining me. It's a pleasure to be here. You have a fantastic story. Your autobiography is just rich with all of these layers, right, these sort of twists and turns. I mean, you didn't, you just have to express or explore rather with me how it is that you came to classics, the liberal arts. What is it in your story that just is the most salient in terms of bringing you into this work that you've now given your life to? Well, I suppose the best uh, place to start would be an incident that uh, uh, ha happened to me or, uh, that, or that I experienced or that I sort of did. Um, uh, when I was uh, living in Africa, I was about uh, 10 years old, I was living in Zambia. I'm the son of Victor and Edie Turner, the anthropologists. And um, uh, we were living in an African village and um, uh, my father and I were driving along in a truck. He was driving, although I was about 10. And um, uh, 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 we were driving through a grove of, of, of African wild plum trees. And I had this absolute moment of um, stunning, what felt to me, revelation. I was astonished by the detail of the leaves and the fruit and the grass blades and everything, that it, everything stood out in this kind of almost psychedelic way. Uh -huh. And I was astonished by it. That, you know, imagine having to build, build one of those trees or build one of those leaves. Right, right. You know, I knew enough at that time, you know, about science that it was a, would have been... Quite an accomplishment, have, yeah. It would have cost a... the national budget for several right. years to build one, you know. And it was right. all done with this perfect detail. So, um, I, I, and then on the heels of that astonishment came a further astonishment that there was something in here, in me, that was perceiving it. That it, it couldn't be a screen exactly, because then who would be watching the screen, you know? <laughs> right. and, um, and, and so uh, I was astonished by that. And it, basically I said to myself that I'm, I, I hope I never stop being astonished, and I never have stopped being astonished. And I think that was the moment when I realized that I was a poet. Um, and it was also the moment where, because, you know, I was brought up by atheist communist parents and um, who were the, 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 you know, in some ways the most wonderful people in the world. And um, uh, at that point, I began to feel that the, um, uh, the principles of dialectical materialism could not be explained by this experience uh, or could no the, the, this experience was could not be explained by dialectical materialism and um, so that was you know I set out then at that point to try to tell everybody about it and that's what I've been doing ever since. <laughs> it is as you put it almost revelatory perhaps even a kind of conversion but you identify that with perhaps the calling the inspiration that you were to be a poet. Is that I didn't I didn't realize you didn't that's know it what then. it was yeah. at the time. Yeah. I later recognized what it was. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I I'd always been I'd always loved to tell stories and mm -hmm. so on. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, at a certain point when I started to read the poets, um, I I knew I, I knew that was what I wanted right. to uh, to do. When you describe it almost as an epiphany, you yeah. know, I'm thinking to myself, well we can't manufacture those, right? Nope. But are there things that we can it's a gift. do? It, that's right. It's a gift. It's a gift. And yet, are there things that we can do as educators? Because you've been teaching and professing for decades. Yes. What what kind of environment? What kind of uh, experiences uh, that might be limited to a classroom or otherwise? But how, as educators, might we at least cultivate the potential? for the astonishment you just described? Well, I, I, I've thought about that a good deal. I'm, I've been, you know, I'm just beginning to get the hang of teaching uh, after 53 years <laughs> um, of doing it. But um, uh, one thing I have noticed is that there are certain times when, uh, first of all, the intellectual and, and imaginative and even to some extent the emotional juices are flowing in a class. Um, when that 
turns suddenly into a personal encounter between you, the teacher, and the students, where uh, we suddenly say to each other, here we are thinking about this thing, that what we're doing is a continuation of something that goes all the way back through the whole tradition of human discourse. And then, in a way, we are, we are, we are performing a kind of ritual play, a ritual game, um, uh, a, a ritual game which has a lineage going back into animal ritual games of mating and of, of contestation and of also of communion and that that goes back to, to the general, general co uh, co cooperation uh, in, uh, of uh, uh, living organisms in an ecosystem and that <coughs> that finally goes back to the, to the strange consilience of the universe as a whole that we are, here we are at this moment um, uh, living this through. This is the adventure. This is, this, if we could just get ourselves to feel it right, this is paradise, huh. you know? Yeah, yeah. I think, I think the, the tradition does reveal this, this experience of sort of, uh, stripping away layers uh, of opacity, right, in order to see more clearly yeah. what is there, yeah. you know, the essence, yeah. right, and so forth, yeah. to be yeah. sure. But for the poets, and I happen to enjoy them very much, they do have a gift. And in a sense, they, they serve as uh, perhaps mediators or, or, or guides, right, in this wonderful cosmos that we inhabit. Yeah, you're right, use the right word there, w wonder. Uh, I mean, I do think that there are poets who are simply gifted. I think there are also poets who are made, who, ma who make themselves. Um, uh, I, and to a large extent, even if one is gifted, one also does have to make oneself. I mean, I, I set out myself. Uh, you know, once I knew what poets were, once I'd read some big poets like right. Milton and so on, then I realize that basically, if you're going to be a poet, you, you, uh, the, the language was your medium, as paint is of a painter, and that I had to know that medium deeply. And that meant that I would have to have a fairly good working knowledge of all the disciplines in, uh, in the language, all, all the crafts, all the, uh, all the scientific disciplines, at least have some kind of, you know, and, and political philosophy and, and, uh, and street slang and, uh, and the whole and, of and, it. And, and the, the whole shebang. Yep. But I would have to, having to be paying attention to all of those and have some kind of nodding acquaintance with, with them at any rate. And then some sense of the history of words, of how words got to be what they are, because every word we use is a metaphor. And, uh, and the, the way that they got from where, what they meant originally to what they mean now is a kind of uh, history of, of, of the language itself as a thinking organism, that the uh, language is thinking and it's using our conversations as the neural firings uh, through, the, through the synapses uh, of some kind of mysterious, um, you know, immaterial brain. Fascinating that it is, as you put it, an organism. Language is alive. Yeah. It's, it's pulsing. Yeah. Because it I mean, let's, let's admit, yeah. in the spirit of the age, dialectical or otherwise, a more yeah. materialistic bent, right? A more, uh, at least in the, in the common parlance, just, just the facts. Just the facts. Give me just the facts. Yeah. Uh, which suggests a far thinner, you know, even facile reading of this pulsing organism that is language that we're sharing and somehow contributing to. Oh, you're yeah. saying it's growing yeah. or it's yeah. emerging yeah. or it's evolving. Yeah. Yeah. You in particular have studied epics at length. Yes. Right? This is sort of a bit of a forte. You've got several. You've got several things you can, that you've done magnificently but uh, and your poetry is highly, highly recommended. I'm just Thank beginning you. to explore it. I'm already uh, way in over my head, which is a good thing which is a good thing. But epic, right, is where you've gone, and specifically, uh, one, of your, uh, one of your works is epic, and yet it's set in a science 
fictional, and that's my term, I don't know if you'd mm. call it that, but a future world. Oh, all three of my epics are set in the future. So tell us that, because we think, at least in these circles, the circles I run in, we think of epics chiefly as those historical greats like Homer and Virgil, or yeah. more recently, Milton, right? Yeah. What, what, are we do what are you doing with a, a science fiction epic? Well, it seems to me that every epic that is, every serious epic that is composed actually adds to the nature of the genre. You can certainly see that in tragedy, for instance, you know, what Shakespeare does to, uh, to Greek, uh, to the Greek idea of tragedy. He, he opens it up, busts it open, makes it grow. And um, now in, in traditional epics, and I've collected something like 60 odd uh, from the world, and it's interesting that every major culture has an epic. Um, uh, it, it, the, the, there's very often an episode that is in fact prophecy. Um, uh, in the Aeneid, for instance, uh, Anchises tells I Aeneas the future history of Rome. And um, in Jerusalem Liber Liberated, there's a, a, a kind of future history of the house of Este, I think. And, uh, but, but, and of course, the biblical epics themselves, the, the Genesis and Exodus, that are two great e epic poems, um, themselves contain huge foreshadowings, huge uh, prophetic uh, uh, elements. And so what I, uh, and, and then, you know, say the book of Revelations, uh, or the, the Apocalypse, is itself a, a, a kind of epic prophecy. So it seems to me that the, the, the future epic is, uh, the epic of the future is already implicit in these great epics of the past. And for our kind of civilization in which, uh, you know, we are, things are changing so fast, and in which we know the past so much better, the true area of mystery where we're going to find insight is, is in the future right? That's, that's where it's going to be. I feel like you've just whet our appetite, and that's probably a good thing. Well, plug, plug, plug. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to tell our audience more about where they can find your books, um, Thank your you. poetry, but also your criticism, your literary criticism, mm -hmm. and other elements that I think will be quite instructive. Thank you so much, Fred, for this time. Thank you, Rob, and thank you for what you're doing. It's amazing. <laughs>